Hello everyone, thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Jessica Williams and I am the Programming Manager at the California Historical Society. Welcome to our program, California Disasters, True Stories of Golden State Tragedies and Triumphs with author Phyllis J. Perry. Before we do anything else, I'd like to acknowledge that the California Historical Society is headquartered in San Francisco in the unceded territory of the Ramatush Ohlone. It is our job at CHS not only to remember this fact, but also to make California's rich, complicated, and diverse past a meaningful part of contemporary life. We do this through public programs like this one, through our research library and collections, and by hosting exhibitions. We currently have two exhibitions on view, Chinese Pioneers, Power and Politics in Exclusion Era Photographs, and From the Gold Rush to the Earthquake. Our galleries at 678 Mission Street are open Wednesday through Saturday, so please visit. There are some quick housekeeping matters that we need to attend to before we move on to our program. First, I need to tell you that this program is being recorded and that the video will be available for viewing on our YouTube channel in the next few days. We are delighted to be presenting this program live and we'll be taking questions at the end. Please use the Q&A feature, which is at the bottom of your screen, and we will try to answer as many questions as we can. For any comments or conversations, please use the chat box also located at the bottom of your screen. We're thrilled to see so many of you here tonight. It lets us know that you're interested in our programs and we want to continue bringing you this kind of programming, but we need your help to do so. So in a few moments, we're going to launch a brief poll and we invite you to answer a few questions. Your participation helps us access important grant funding for programs like this one. This is completely voluntary and anonymous, and the results will not be shared with the audience. It's just a few multiple choice questions, and you'll have about two minutes to answer them. Be sure to hit the submit button at the end of the poll. Okay, I'm going to launch the poll now. Here we go. Thank you very much for taking our poll. And now I'd like to introduce you to our speaker. Phyllis J. Perry grew up in Grass Valley, a small gold mining town in Northern California. After earning her bachelor's degree in English literature from California State University, Berkeley, um, I'm sorry, University of California, Berkeley. She was an elementary school teacher at the Mount Diablo Unified School District. She went on to study education, earning her master's degree in San Francisco State University and her doctorate at the University of Colorado Boulder. Phyllis worked for 20 years in the Boulder Valley Schools as a teacher, building principal and director of talented and gifted education. Perry retired full-time and she is award-winning author of 95 fiction and nonfiction books for both children and adults, including her most recent book, California Disasters, True Stories of Golden State Tragedies and Triumphs. She is also a member of the Colorado Authors League and the Society of Children, Book Writers and Illustrators. Welcome Phyllis Perry. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's wonderful to have you. Oh, Phyllis, sorry, you're muted still. Please press the um, unmute. There we go. Uh, one more time. <laughs> oh, you'll just have to press me unmute one more time. There we go. You can hear me now? I can hear you now. Thank you. <laughs> well, welcome, everyone. 
I'm happy to be with you here tonight from my home in Boulder, Colorado. As Jessica said, I was born and grew up in Northern California in the small town of Grass Valley. It's about 60 miles north of Sacramento. It's a small community surrounded by half a dozen gold mines and the early people who settled the community, a large number of them, were immigrants from Cornwall, England um, with tin mining expertise. After graduating from schools in Grass Valley, I went to the University of California, Berkeley. And actually it was in Berkeley, in the library, that I experienced my first California disaster, a small earthquake. Even though it was small, it was scary. And those of you in the audience who've been in an earthquake know that once you felt one, you never really forget that feeling. And um, it was a, an introduction to me to earthquakes in California, a very small one. My book, California Disasters, spans 200 years of California history and many, many types of disasters some of which um, we can lay blame on mother nature, some of which we have to claim there was a strong human element in the disaster. Both kinds are discussed in the book. It's also the case that these disasters, whether they be earthquakes or floods or the failure of a dam, um, droughts, airplane crashes, train wrecks. Although these are times that people suffer tremendous uh, sense of loss, both of um, human lives, animals, uh, our environment, there are also times when people rise to the occasion. And in each of these areas of disasters, I've tried to share with you some stories of the kindness and thoughtfulness, the heroism of the people who were involved in those disasters. Now, obviously, in an evening, there's no way we can cover uh, or even attempt to cover many of the disasters that are discussed in some detail in the book. But I do want to share with you tonight seven disasters. And as Jessica said, if you have questions along the way, um, please save them and during our chat session, we'll, we'll try to answer those that we can. The first that I want to talk to you about is what I consider to be the most famous California disaster. And that has to be the San Francisco earthquake and fire of 1906. That was a tremendous quake, um, somewhere between 6.9 and 7.2 on the Richter scale. It struck early in the morning and it struck hard. It lasted almost for a minute. And as the ground shook, many people uh, recounted or wrote their experiences afterwards a common theme was being thrown out of bed in the wee hours of the morning, trying to figure out what was going on. Uh, going to a window if you were in an upstairs um, building and looking out and seeing people rushing out into the streets, um, parts of buildings toppling to the sidewalk and general mayhem and confusion. Not only was there an earthquake, that would have been totally sufficient for our disaster, but as a result of that earthquake, gas mains and water lines broke. So throughout the city, hundreds of fires broke out. And because of the breaks in the water main, it was very difficult to even try to, uh, to put out these fires. One of the first casualties mentioned in the 1906 earthquake 
was San Francisco's fire chief. He was at the fire station. The building next door collapsed and fell in on the fire station, killing the fire chief in that first moment of the earthquake. As the people felt aftershocks, afraid to go back inside, they were out in the street pulling almost anything that had wheels, whether it was a baby buggy, a wagon, anything they could drag. Many took a few moments to throw their valuables into a suitcase of some kind and had it outside dragging it with them. As the fires broke out, it became evident that major activity was going to have to take place uh, to stop these fires. Police, firemen, military personnel, Navy personnel, Marines, um, National Guard, all sent in people to help. But building after building and block after block blazed. It was finally decided that the only way to stop the fire was to create some kind of a fire wall. And the best way to do that was um, to collapse a big building in the path of the fire. This was hard to do. Um, it took courage to decide to dynamite a building that wasn't actually burning at the moment. And it also took courage to use dynamite in an area where fires were all around, sparks were flying through the area. But they did dynamite buildings and eventually um, stopped the progress of the fire. But not until 500 blocks of San Francisco had burned. Meanwhile, the earthquake had liquefied some of the soil areas around San Francisco so that buildings uh, not only collapsed with pieces falling off, but buildings actually sank into the ground. In some cases, there was a three-story hotel and um, moments after the earthquake, the bottom two stories of the hotel were already under the ground. It was the third story that was at ground level. In San Francisco, the night before the earthquake was a very famous person, Enrico Caruso. He had been there to perform with the New York Philharmonic at the San Francisco Opera House. It was a beautiful performance. He went home that night to the fanciest, most plush hotel in San Francisco. It was up on the seventh floor. And Caruso wrote about it a few weeks later in a journal and described how he had gone to the window and seen absolute bedlam outside. His valet came and quickly packed all our possessions into cases and dragged them, not wanting to attempt to use anything like an elevator, dragged them down seven flights of stairs to the front of the hotel, managed to get down to the ferry, get Caruso aboard the ferry, across the bay, and eventually onto a train and back to New York. Caruso said he would never visit the city of San Francisco again, and he did not. Another person involved in that earthquake was the writer Jack London, who lived with his wife north of the city. He received uh, a telegram asking him to write about the earthquake for Collier's Magazine. So he and his wife actually went into the city rather than away from it. They found the streets filled with people, many of whom were trying to get uh, to the wharf of the dock to exit the city. Indeed, for days after the earthquake, the Southern Pacific Railroad offered free transportation out of the city to anyone who wanted to take it. One of the groups that was particularly terrified were those inmates in jails in the city who were afraid they would be forgotten and left there perhaps to burn to death. But actually they were taken out of the jail, marched down to the wharf, and taken out to Alcatraz, which suffered almost no damage because of the hard rock that it was built on. And those prisoners were there for a couple weeks. 
two interesting things came out of that earthquake. As committees organized to bring help to the people who needed it, supplies of foods to parks and squares, uh, a water supply for people. It was also noted that in order to start any kind of recovery and rebuilding, money was going to be needed. Many of the banks had burned, and although the valuable papers and currency were in vaults, they were afraid to open the vaults for fear that the sudden inrush of oxygen uh, could ignite and destroy uh, the documents and the currency. And some of those banks uh, were unable to open vaults for a number of weeks after the earthquake. An exception to this was a small bank in San Francisco, the Bank of Italy, run by the immigrant Giannini. He was able to take about $70,000 out of his vault, put it in a cart, and drag the cart down to the wharf, where over the next several days, he set up a, a sort of a makeshift bank, and just on the basis of a handshake, made small loans to those who needed it following this disaster. As a result, the bank gained many um, customers, and by the 1950s, had changed its name from Bank of Italy to Bank of America, and was the largest bank in the world. Another group that had an unexpected benefit from the earthquake was the Chinese community in San Francisco. It's uncertain as to how many there are. Estimates are that there were perhaps 20,000 Chinese living there at the time. The children who were born in the United States automatically became American citizens. But the older Chinese who had immigrated here found it almost impossible with the rules at the time to gain citizenship. However, since City Hall had burned down and records had been destroyed, many of those citizens claimed that their um, citizenship papers or their birth certificates had been burned in the fire and they were in fact citizens. So it did have some pluses. The city, through hard work and effort within just a few years, had rebuilt sufficiently that they hosted the big Pan American World Fair uh, to sort of show people that, yes, we were down, but no, we're not out, and look, look how quickly we built. So I would say that of all the disasters in the book, the 1906 earthquake is the most famous. But in my opinion, it's not the worst. The worst of the disasters to me is the flood of 1862. That flood was an amazing one. California had had a drought, not unusual as you know, and when it began raining that fall in late September, October, November, those rains were welcomed. But the rains that began in November didn't stop. It rained in November, it rained in December, it looked as if it was never going to stop. S some of the newspapers at the time, including the little Grass Valley paper, had an article which said they had nine inches of rain in just 36 hours. Bridges were washed out. Almost all the rivers in the state were overflowing their banks. Communication was completely cut off. In Sacramento, it was time for the inauguration of the governor, Leland Stanford, and instead of a parade through the streets of San Francisco with banners and buntings and um, cheerleaders and excitement, a rowboat went out to take Stanford into the Capitol for his swearing in ceremony. At that time, the waters were still rising uh, almost a foot and an hour at that point. They had the shortest ceremony they could possibly conduct, sent him back home again, 
by the time he got home, he had to enter his house through a second story window. The streets of, Sa of Sacramento were flooded, many of them 10 and 15 feet deep in water. Um, the, the city could hardly believe what was happening there, but it was happening throughout the state. A lake formed in California that was 300 miles long and 20 miles wide, and in many places, uh, 20 feet deep. It looked as if um, California might never recover from this flood. It was actually months later before uh, parts of the state dried out. Records are incomplete as to the loss of life, but it's assumed that at least 2,000 people were drowned in that disaster. Many of the mining camps in the northern part of the state had laborers living uh, close to rivers. Those people stayed in their cabins thinking that that's certainly the safest place to be during this deluge of rain. But the rain was so strong that it simply swept the cabins away and um, hundreds, probably a couple thousand people were drowned. And it wasn't just people and the devastation of the landscape of, of uh, homes and businesses and trees and vegetation. But the estimate at the time was that at least one quarter of all the cattle in the state of California drowned and a quarter of all the sheep drowned. It was a huge, huge flood. Those first two disasters that I've shared with you, uh, we attribute to Mother Nature. And the next two I'd like to talk about have a strong human factor. And they both deal with paddle boats. Paddle boats became very popular in California as a means of transportation. The early ones that were first used, and the one I'm going to talk about first is called the Sagamore were fairly small, maybe a hundred feet from one end to the other. And they often took um, 75, 80 passengers. They also took goods up and down the river. The most common form of transportation at that time was stagecoach. And it took hours to get anywhere, plus being a very confined and bumpy ride. And so paddle boats, started to become popular. When more, more, more were built and brought into the West Coast uh, and the price went down, it began to be a very common means for people to um, take small paddle boats up the various rivers, depending on the water flow, and larger ones uh, out to sea. It was in 1861 that word reached California that at long last it had been admitted to statehood. Um, it took a while for the message from Washington to be disseminated throughout the state. And in fact, it was October that the big celebrations of statehood were actually held in San Francisco. There were parades, fireworks, uh, big banquets and dances, and some people came via paddle boat, uh, docked, and spent the day uh, celebrating the events, and then were leaving. That's the case with the Sagamore, which I included because I think of it as the unluckiest of all the disasters in the book. The steam engine in the Sagamore uh, blew up. This was not unusual. Between 1850 and 1880, there were at least 80 explosions of this sort, um, killing upwards of two, three hundred people. But the Sagamore sank within easy sight of the dock, and so people on shore um, saw it sinking, got small boats, went out to it to try to rescue people, 
of the 79 people on board, 40 of them were blown out of the ship and into the water, including the captain, who did survive. He was, was injured, but he was rescued alive. Half of them were killed, either by the explosion or the burning of the steam. But people on shore brought and rescued people, uh, more than 30 of them, to shore and took them to San Francisco hospitals. The reason they're so unlucky is that one group were taken to a hospital which, believe it or not, that night caught fire. And so those victims of that awful explosion were now victims of a hospital fire. Another paddle boat, a rather famous one, was the Brother Jonathan. The Brother Jonathan is included for really a couple reasons. One, it was the biggest maritime disaster the state has ever seen. And secondly, it's the longest disaster. The Brother Jonathan was a big ship, 200 uh, feet from end to end, two decks, um, a big salon, places to eat, rather fancy rooms for the guests. And it would um, frequently make journeys both with people and with goods up the coast. On this particular date, it was headed to Portland. And records indicate that the captain, uh, Mr. DeWolf, was unhappy when he came um, to start his journey because he felt that the ship was very, very heavily laden with goods, including some heavy mining machinery. Um, however, it was to leave on time and it was suggested that if the captain didn't want to take it, there were other captains who'd be glad to do so. And so um, they started out on their journey, waiting for a tide because it was sitting so low in the water and a tugboat to help them get started. And they went up the coast in the Brother Jonathan um, as far as Crescent City. By this time, they had found themselves uh, in a big storm at sea. They stopped at Crescent City to uh, let off um, a couple people and a few of the goods and then started on their journey again. But within four or five miles, of shore, the captain decided that the storm was such that he should turn back and anchor in at Crescent City and wait out the storm. So they turned the Brother Jonathan back to Crescent City and were headed back to the bay when a huge wave picked up the ship and dashed it down on an uncharted rock. There's a reef in that area, St. George's Reef, and it has spires of sharp rocks that come up um, 200 feet from the ocean floor. And the ship, the Jonathan, was picked up and actually dashed down onto one of these sharp rocks, which cut a hole in the hull. And the next wave crashed it on another one, ripping open the bottom of the ship. It was apparently evident to the captain immediately that there was nothing to be done. The ship was going to sink. In fact, it sank in 45 minutes. Um, on the ship were about uh, 200 passengers and 50 crew. They had sufficient lifeboats for that quantity, four of them great big ones, and uh, another four that were small. However, the storm was bashing waves and wind. Water was washing over the deck. And as they lowered the first rowboat into the water, it immediately capsized. Uh, the second and third one were no better. They were blown by the wind and dashed against the ship itself and broken into bits. A second mate on the ship took one of the smaller boats and he gathered together. Uh, a few of the crew 
uh, four women, a few children, gone on this boat and gone in the water. Those 19 people made it ashore. It took three hours, uh, and it must have been a horrendous uh, experience getting from that boat and watching the Brother Jonathan sink. But all of the others, over 200 people, were drowned. That, however, was not the end of the story of this particular disaster, which I think of as the longest of the disasters in my book. It was as a result of the publicity of this huge disaster that efforts were made to build a lighthouse in that area. Um, it was just shortly at the, at the end, really, of the Civil War. There wasn't a lot of money, but Congress did allow a few thousand dollars for exploration of what it would take to build a, a, a lighthouse in such a dangerous place. They would only be able to work there in spring and summer because the currents and storms were such that it would be prohibitive to try to work at other times of the year. There was was a, a man who felt it could be done and he found a place where there was granite rock. They quarried that rock, brought it close to the shore, shaped it so that it would fit together, actually took another boat, lashed it to the rock they were building nearby, seal rock, and the men who worked at building the lighthouse used that tethered boat as their place to sleep and eat, and by ropes were able to get to uh, the land where they were building the lighthouse and to their tools. It took a number of years, but they finally did succeed in building the uh, St. George Lighthouse there, and it lasted for a good period of time into the 1950s. So that's a story that of a disaster that had effects that lasted a long, long time. And that's not the end of the story. When that ship set off for Portland, the Brother Jonathan, it had some very important things on board. First of all, it had the newly appointed governor for the Washington Territory. It also had the governor for the uh, land up there, not yet a state, that was the Northwest Territory. On board was a paymaster who was taking money, uh, over $200,000 in paper money, to pay um, army personnel in various forts along the California and what's now Oregon and Washington coast. And another paymaster who had golden coins, and these were to pay to Native American tribes who were promised in exchange for their lands from settlers who were um, rapidly coming over the plains, um, an annual payment and so this ship had on board both important people, important cargo, gold coins, and a good deal of money. When the ship sank and all except those 18 were killed, of course, all those things uh, were lost. And so fortune hunters, salvage hunters, immediately set forth to try to find out if they could find the wreckage of the brother Jonathan and what they thought would be considerable treasure. There were at least 45 salvage companies and expeditions that attempted this, all unsuccessfully, until one finally succeeded, a deep sea exploration group used a submersible went down and about eight miles from Crescent City, found the wreckage 
of the Brother Jonathan. They brought up a few things uh, from the ship and filed their claim then in the court that the treasure that they were to find and bring up <clears throat> would belong to them. And indeed, they felt they deserved it. They had spent, according to them, already over a million dollars in their exploration efforts. However, the state of California looked at it differently. It felt that that government money, coins, whatever was there, belonged to the state of California, not to the uh, salvage hunters. And so that case found its way into the court. The lower courts uh, couldn't seem to come to a satisfactory agreement, went all the way to the United States Supreme Court, who referred it back to the lower court. And finally, it became obvious that people were simply going to have to negotiate or it would uh, never be settled. And so an agreement was reached, but not until 1999. And in that agreement, the salvage company ended up with about 80% of what they found they could keep, and 20% would go to the state. They found scattered on the floor of the ocean there uh, over 1,200 gold coins. These were five, 10, and $20 gold pieces, and they were in various states of. Uh, of fineness, depending upon whether they had been uh, somewhat protected over the years or whether they had been ground by the sand a lot. But a big auction was held of these, um, and a hundred of the coins were given to the state, and the state in turn gave it, gave those coins to various maritime museums. But 1,100 of the coins kept by the salvage company were auctioned off and um, brought in, I believe, over $6 million. So the story of the brother Jonathan was not just a maritime loss, was not just the building of a lighthouse, but it was also the finding of a treasure. The safe on board, supposedly containing a lot of money, uh, has never been located, but I imagine there are probably still companies that are looking for it. So while the first two disasters I spoke of, fire, earthquake, and flood, were part of Mother Nature, and the next two were sort of man-made, the fifth one I've included because I think it was the most spectacular of the disasters in the book. And that is the eruption of Mount Lassen. Mount Lassen had been an extinct volcano. <clears throat> no one alive had ever seen any activity there. But in 1914 and in 1915, um, people in the area saw a sort of a rosy glow above the top of Mount Lassen. Sometimes things that look like sparks flying out. Three men climbed up the top to take a look to see what was going on and saw that a volcanic cauldron had been formed um, within the mountain top. And as a matter of fact, while they were there, uh, several rocks were spit up out of the mountain and a volcano into the air. Uh, they ran as quickly as they could and decided that it was no place to be. But it was in May of 1915 that one of the ranchers who uh, had some cattle part way up Mount Lassen heard his dog barking during the night. And he thought there was probably some wild animal that was threatening his herd. He went um, outside to see what was going on and was amazed to look up the creek and see a very slow moving mass coming down. It was a mass of uh, molten rock, of 
on dirt of torn up trees and shrubs. And he ran a mile to his neighbor's house downhill where they had a telephone and phoned all their neighbors. Uh, and so this, although a spectacular disaster, is one in which no lives were lost. On May 22nd, the Mount Lassany erupted and sent this column that you can see here in the picture 30,000 30, feet into the air. Uh, ash rained for miles around. Although no one was killed, a certainly a large part of Mount Lassen and the area around it was destroyed. It's often referred to as the devastated area. And this area has been included in the Mount Lassen National Park. People who visit there uh, can get very close to some of the rocks that were thrown out the, at the time that are um, huge rocks, several tons. The landscape at this point, uh, of course, much of it has grown back, but the devastated area has proved to be a spot where those studying volcanism have um, been able to see the firsthand effects. And there are many people who think that, not necessarily Mount Lassen, but somewhere in that area, which we know in hundreds of thousands of years ago was active, could again um, explode. At this point, there are lots of sensors there and data is certainly gathered so that if there's any volcanic activity going on, um, people would hear about it. Back to an, another disaster, one that was man-made, is the failure of the um, St. Francis Dam. This is an interesting one in that a young man whose name was Mulholland immigrated to the United States from Ireland to New York, and he and his brother stowed away on a ship, got as far as Panama when they were discovered. According to him, they walked across the Isthmus of Panama, stowed on another ship, and got into the Los Angeles area. He tried a number of things, but the job he finally settled on was that of a ditch digger. At that time, in 1857, Los Angeles had less than 10,000 people, but it was clear the area was going to grow, and one of the things it was going to need was water. While he was basically just a ditch digger during the day, Mulholland studied at night and became uh, very skillful as an engineer. He worked his way up through the ranks um, in the water department there until he became chief of the water department in Los Angeles. One of the things that he did was to buy a lot of land in the Owens Valley and build an aqueduct to carry water over 200 miles into the city of Los Angeles. Many of the people thought this was stealing water and there would vandalize this aqueduct, so it was always in need of repairs. Mulholland worried about that, and he worried about the fact that an earthquake could also destroy the aqueduct. And so he set about uh, securing land and building five large reservoirs, which are still being used as a water supply for Los Angeles. But what he really wanted to do was to build a dam where he could store enough water to supply the city of Los Angeles for a year. And he chose as a spot a place on San Francisco Creek, and he built the dam there. It was over 200 feet tall. 
and was the largest dam of its arch type at that time. From the very beginning, people worried about the dam. There was always some leakage around the base. And uh, people would often jokingly say, well, okay, I'll see you next Wednesday if the dam don't leak. It was a, apparently a very common expression there. Well, one day, it did. The, there was a powerhouse both above and below the dam. Um, and the dam supplied electricity for the city. One of these powerhouse keepers um, felt that the base of the dam was leaking more than usual. He wasn't comfortable with it. He phoned Mulholland, and Mulholland and his, his chief engineer uh, left Los Angeles, came up to the dam, and spent several hours there inspecting it. And it was true there was some leakage, but not a lot. And they didn't think it was a dangerous thing. They went back to the city. Well, that night, just before midnight, uh, the dam broke. That reservoir had filled and it was holding 12 billion gallons of water. When the dam broke, the water came flooding down through uh, both Los Angeles and Ventura County. Again, there's not an accurate measurement, but it is estimated that as many as 4,000 people may have lost their lives in that dam breakage. The fellow who was the powerhouse keeper got his wife and two children and tried to flee the house. By the time they got to the front door, the water was already at the roof and they were just swept away. He was able to swim back to the surface, uh, held onto a pole, got from there onto the roof of a building that was floating by, climbed on that roof, which when it crashed into the bank, he managed to hop off and survive. As a matter of fact, um, he went back to work for the company again in the future. A, a number of things happened as a result. One, of course, was that there was an immediate uh, trial held. Mulholland was at the trial, uh, and he was quick to say, if human error was involved, look no further for the human, it was me. The city of Los Angeles took responsibility for the failure and to make things easier for people who uh, were suing for loss of um, businesses, homes, property. They set up a committee, one didn't even have to go to court. One could go before the committee and submit the claims. So that was a, an enormous, um, loss of, of life, and um, certainly of the man-made ones, the most, the most tragic loss of life of all the disasters in the book. The last one I want to talk about, I chose because um, even though it's a disaster and a major one, it does have an interesting romantic aspect. The North Ridge earthquake uh, caused tremendous damage. A lot of it centered in North Ridge where there were buildings like the one you see here. Uh, first and second stories crashed to the ground. Uh, parts of the walls fell down. Um, one person who had just arrived in the area that the night before whose furniture hadn't even arrived yet, was sleeping on the ground in, a, in the empty uh, house that they were going to live in. Couldn't believe the shaking of the ground. Another woman who was uh, expecting a baby, as a matter of fact, was eight days overdue, had her um, 
labor contractions at the same time as the earthquake. Her husband rushed her off to a hospital. To their dismay, they were turned away. They were evacuating the hospital um, for fear that the hospital itself would collapse. The woman went off to another hospital. Uh, they were filled both with their own patients, with patients from hospitals that were being evacuated, and from new victims from the Northwich quake, quake itself. Um, there was no room for her, but they did find a gurney. The woman did have her baby. And about an hour after it was born, they were told that simply was no room in the hospital for them. They needed every bed, gurney, and room they had. So the woman and her husband and their brand new baby drove to the, to the woman's mother's house, not too far away. They were afraid to go inside because of the aftershocks, but they sat with that new baby out in the driveway um, for the remainder of the, of the day. The little baby boy, had a nickname that they used after that. They always called him Shaky in honor of the big quake. But one of the buildings in Northridge that gave way was an apartment building. And the man who lived there was named Mike Cubacy. And Mike was not injured um, with the quake, but quickly got out and began coming to the rescue of other people who were less fortunate in the building. He's credited with saving at least five lives that time. One of the people who was up in a second story, he was able to find a sort of a rickety ladder and drag it over to the window so that the woman up on the second floor could come down the ladder to safety. And she was simply too terrified by the quake and by the shaking of the ladder to do so. So he went up to help her and helped her step by step down that ladder to the ground. Um, the interesting thing was that less than a year later, the two of them were married. And so uh, that earthquake spawned a romance. Mike went on to have an interesting career as a television photographer who was working on shows like uh, NCIS and Grey's Anatomy. So out of that particular disaster, uh, a romance bloomed. So those are some of the disasters that you would read about if you're interested in getting my book, California Disasters. You'll also read about uh, dust storms and shark attacks. And unfortunately, a large section about wildfires, because California, as I'm sure you're all aware, is suffering another one right now uh, up in the very northern tip of the state uh, with huge losses, both from the fire and from the often mudslides that follow. But I'd like to think that these disasters also are times to be grateful for the human beings that just somehow managed to come forward and help and rescue others and make uh, a terrible disaster less awful. Thank you, Phyllis, so much for sharing your research. Um, on these on these tragic um, happenings in our state, um, it's it's interesting to learn about these, um, especially the the more historic ones that have taken place, you know, long ago. Um, one question I had was, you know, for the more recent disasters. I know you covered the one the most recent one you talk about here is in 1994, but I know you do cover some more recent in history, uh, including some of the wildfires in 2018 and beyond. Um, were you able to actually interview any survivors from some of these more recent disasters? No, I did not do interviews. The closest I got to it was that many of the uh, newspapers like the uh, Los Angeles Times or even the New York Times did send 
people and crews uh, out to film and to interview people. And I was able to read those interviews and see those um, videos, but I did not myself um, interview survivors. Um, I want to encourage everyone in the chat, if you're interested in asking questions, we'll now jump into our Q&A session at the talk. Um, and I know, Phyllis, you had asked if there's anyone who has survived a California disaster, if you'd be interested in sharing um, sharing in the chat, just um, if you're interested, um, we'd love to hear from you as well. Um, one question that came in is the photo of the flood. Is that in old Sacramento or where is that picture um, located? In Sacramento, apparently, originally was built um, not, not very much above sea level, and it suffered a number of floods prior to this big one. So a lot of earth was brought in, and the actual downtown business district was raised a number of feet, but certainly not sufficient for the flood. So this is one of the main business areas in the city of Sacramento. I see. Um, thank you for thank you for clarifying that. Um, and your research, um, what what is what is the most common question that you hear about the subject and, and your work? Fortunately, in working on this book, the <clears throat> the editor at Far Country Press that I worked with is named Will Harmon, and Will Harmon is not only a great editor but a great historian. And he uh, had many connections with federal groups uh, like the national bureaus that had fairly detailed records, particularly of things, um, if it's a transportation issue, if it's a railroad accident or an airplane accident. And he was able to, um, to get a number of these records and a number of the pictures for the book for us. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, is, is there something that's most misunderstood or unknown about any of the stories in your book or what would be the most, most maybe unknown story that you covered? The most, I think of the ones that I've talked about tonight, the one that's least discussed is the flood which sort of surprises me. Picture that beautiful state of California with a lake 300 miles long <laughs> coming down the middle of it. And yet um, it is not as well known as, as the earthquakes or uh, the fires that have broken out. Um, also, perhaps because uh, I grew up in Grass Valley, there are a number of chapters in this book that deal with um, mine disasters and cave-ins that are probably lesser known to people who have spent their lives in cities rather than in gold mining communities. Um, but one of the one of the interesting things about disasters is that they just keep coming. Um, so, you know, since we've been discussing this book, you suddenly have the uh, huge fire erupt in the northern part of the state. We had one here in Boulder uh, this last December, which was only about seven miles from our home. And from a very small beginning, uh, it ended up being the largest and costliest fire in Colorado history. And we, uh, our neighborhood was not burned at all, but five miles away, uh, every house on the block burned. Uh, it was one of those times when it was, we have some horrendous winds here. There was a windstorm that night and the fire just took off. Um, in California, the recent one in Yosemite is one that I'm sure all of us have been following and hoping to get that under control. 
there's not only the loss of life, but the, the loss of our parks and our beautiful redwoods there. Uh, and it just seems to be no end to these disasters. Yeah, absolutely. And just, you know, so timely considering the McKinney fire and it's like something like 55,000 acres that have been burned. And um, it's just so tragic and lives that are being, you know, have been lost. And um, we're starting to see this more and more every year now in California. And um, it's just, it hits home for a lot of us, you know, a lot of folks who have um, had to live through this. And um, and it's just, like you mentioned, it's just, um, it seems random when it comes to fires and which way they're going to head. And and to have that 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 um, fear of having to evacuate your home and lose your home, and so um, you know this hits home for a lot of folks, I'm sure, in California. And um, and so thank you for for sharing you know your comments on that. Um, what are what drew you to this topic, and and what made you want to write about this? Well, actually, the editor at uh, Far Country Press had asked if I would like to write the book on Colorado disasters. I have written about five books about California history, and uh, it seemed to him that I might be a good person to do this. But because I had just finished writing two books, one about Rocky Mountain National Park, and one about um, some of the villains uh, Speaking Yellow of the Dead, as the book is called, uh, in Colorado history, I said I really wasn't up for writing a, another Colorado book that year. Um, but I would like to look back at my old home state of California and write about it. And so it was agreed that I would do two books, The California Disasters First, which is now out, and then Colorado Disasters, which has now been written and which will be published uh, next month. So um, I started out by saying, um, not Colorado this year, but California. <laughs> Chose California because of, of living there and feeling it's one of my two homes. Oh, wonderful. And so we'll definitely have to put your website in the chat so folks can find um, information on your next book, uh, Colorado Disasters, as well. Um, you know, I know you had a lot of um, a lot of information for this book. I know there's plenty in California um, to talk about. Someone asked, uh, what age group is this audience? Uh, what, yeah, what age group audience is your book written for? California Disasters is written for adults. Um, that's not to say that a, a younger person couldn't enjoy it. One of the books that I wrote uh, two years ago now was all about Julia Morgan, who is a famous San Francisco architect who came in after the earthquake and did a lot of rebuilding. That book is definitely aimed for upper elementary, middle school readers. Uh, but California disasters, and Colorado disasters are aimed at an adult audience. Okay, I know you've written many children's books um, uh, over time, and um, so the Julia Morgan book can also be found on your website, is that correct? Yes, uh, my website would have uh, books, fiction, nonfiction, even a book of poetry, um, but describing them, whether they're for um, elementary kids, middle level kids, senior high students, or for adults. We'll, we'll be sure to put that in the chat for folks so they can um, have access Good. to that. And um, if, if people do have thoughts or questions after today that they didn't get to ask, um, please feel free to contact me on my website. I check it out and I'll be glad to try to answer questions or just hear from you and would enjoy that. I'll say it out loud. It's www.phyllisjperry.com for those who are listening in. Right. Um, there's a question that came in from the audience. Um, I've heard that there was an insurance company that, like the Bank of America, made its reputation after the 1906 earthquake. In this case, they were not, uh, or they were the only one that found a way to make a, to make good on all of their policies. Do you know anything about this? No. <laughs> I really don't. 
I know that um, as a result of Giannini's action that day, the Bank of America really grew throughout the state. But uh, in many cases, for instance, after the San Francisco um, earthquake or after the um, failure of the St. Francis Dam, there have been changes in laws in California and changes in insurance that followed. For instance, when the St. Francis Dam was made, it did not have to have a state inspection. Now, such a dam would. Uh, so as building codes changed in San Francisco as to the type of structures that could be built, that has an effect then on the insurance factor. Uh, in some cases, um, people can get insurance. In other cases, insurance against some of these disasters is simply too costly for most people to afford. Right, it's understandable. And um, and just thinking through, you know, it's, it's tragic that some of these disasters would have to happen in order for the state to to create some more laws around safety and um, insurance policies and things. It's sort of like, um, but because that dam broke, then there was then policies later on created to to make sure right. there's safety safety protocols and things that happened in the earthquake safety and um, and so it's it's good that we now have all those things, but tragic that you know the disaster had to take place first. And a, a number of things uh, we kind of learned the hard way. But Julia Morgan, for instance, is the person who really introduced into common use reinforced concrete. And so when she built at the University of California, Berkeley, the Greek theater, that was the first real structure that was built out of this reinforced concrete. Wow. And she worked at Mills College, um, built the bell tower there. And it's, I think, significant that although the East Bay suffered damage from that uh, San Francisco earthquake, the bell tower, at which Julie Mills built, did not suffer damage. Wow, so we have learned uh, and sometimes apply the lesson. Sometimes it seems too costly and they take shortcuts and those uh, shortcuts result in a building that can't sustain uh, a really severe earthquake. And we're talking, of, of course, those that are registering your seven points on the Richter scale. Um, California, I guess, has little earthquakes all the time, <laughs> but not, not big ones. And we've learned a lot about how to build and protect um, both against fire and against quake. And I've learned an awful lot about um, flooding and reservoirs and dams. Um, unfortunately, still much to learn. With wildfires, there just doesn't seem to be a a solution. Um, there's probably time for one more question. Um, is there a recent California disaster that you think we will be referring to as one of the great disasters in history? I don't know that that one can really predict, but I think that as we keep increasing in population and cities get larger and larger and we have fewer open areas, I think that major disasters may very well center around fires because um, those living conditions are such that like the one we just had here uh, seven months ago, um, they just swept from house to house to house. And suddenly, you know, millions of dollars. Uh, fortunately, in our fire, only two lives were lost. But in terms of the cost, uh, I think that fires uh, are taking their toll and, and perhaps are going to be the most expensive of, of the disasters that we see. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I know, um, I know the state is working towards, um, you know, uh, fire preparedness and, and, um, and trying to figure out ways to prevent fires. And so, and that, I really think that would be a wonderful topic for our program soon and, and native birding practices and um, sort of, you know, going back to those old ways of, of preventing fires. Um, but, you know, it seems like it's such a burden, it's such a huge undertaking. Um, and just hopefully there's some hope there and learning about fire safety. And it's, it's something that everyone as a Californian mm -hmm. needs to know is earthquake safety and fire safety. And it just sort of comes with the territory. Yeah, needing a really strict laws as to the sorts of materials um, that go into the sidewall of houses, the roofs of the houses, and the businesses. Um, and we we don't like these things because they they're more expensive. But the fact is, we've reached a point where it's simply not safe to do it with less than preparedness. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, thank you, Phyllis, so much for being with us tonight and for sharing your research. Um, you know, I know that it's a solemn and tragic topic, but it's, it's good to learn from our history so that we can be prepared for the future. And so thank you so much for writing this book. Um, we'd like to put the link in the chat if you're interested in purchasing California Disasters. The True Stories of Golden State Tragedies and Triumphs, we'll add that to the chat. Please um, feel free to purchase that, uh, click the link to purchase that. Also um, visit Phyllis's website for all of her other wonderful books, including Colorado Disasters that's coming out, uh, just say next month, uh, which is very exciting. Um, and um, if you'd like to ask Phyllis any questions, you can also reach out to her directly at her website as well, uh, www.phyllisjperry.com. Thank you um, so much for thank you. having me with you tonight and for um, for listening, and I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much, Phyllis. It was a wonderful to speak with you and learn more about your research, and thank you to our audience for being with us this evening as well. Um, please join us for our next talk, which is called Freedom to Discriminate, How Realtors Conspired to Segregate Housing and Divide America with Gene Slater. This program will take place on Thursday, September 8th at 5.30, online via Zoom. We also have a community day celebrating Chinese American history and culture taking place at our gallery at 678 Mission Street on Saturday, August 13th from 12 to 4 p.m. This event will commemorate the closing of our exhibition, Chinese Pioneers, Power and Politics and Exclusion Era Photographs, and will include hands-on activities for all ages, as well as an exclusive show and tell in our library featuring collections related to Chinese American history. Um, you can find registration links for both of these events on our website, and we can also put that link in the chat if you're interested. Um, if you enjoyed our program, please consider making a donation. Your contribution will help to continue to collect, share, and honor the diverse stories from throughout our state. Uh, to donate, click the link in the chat as well. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you again, Phyllis, for joining us, and um, we look forward to seeing you all next time. Uh, good evening, everyone.